If you clicked on this video, you're going through a tough time right now. You're extremely emotionally attached and obsessively thinking about that one person. You think there's no way you ever feel better because you lost your soulmate that you will never find again. That one and only person that made you feel like no one else made you feel. You can't even feel any emotions for other people at the moment and are constantly thinking about how to fix this or at least come to a place where you feel happy again. But you don't see a way out out of this emotional pain because you can only think that there's no one who has the same character like that person you just lost. So you think something went wrong and it's all your fault. Every day is a fight. Well you clicked on the right video because today I will show you how to move on be detached not only that I will also show you how you will be better off than ever before and meet a better person than the one that you just lost sometimes the right information can change your entire life you might be like what can he say that no one has told me before or I haven't thought of I've seen all the TikToks, the breakup videos, and nothing helps. What you should really ask yourself is why I'm so confident. There must be something this guy knows. I used to be in many toxic relationships and had to go through many hard breakups. Over time, I learned ways to use tools to not only move on, but also come to the other side as a stronger and happier person. I also learned to change the patterns that made me attracted to these women in the first place and I always met way better women for me. Some of the tools we are going to explore today to let go of attachments are directly coming from ACT and ERP therapy. Those are behavioral therapies. Behavioral therapies are so powerful because the language of the brain is behavior. And this is also the answer to your question. The reason why you're obsessed, if you believe it or not, is the behavior you're doing inside and outside of your head. The tools I'm giving you today have proven themselves to help thousands of clients to break toxic patterns and to have better relationship with themselves and others. I'm going to tell you a secret. Go to people who have done what you want to do. Listen again because this is important. Go to people who have done what you want to do. Not to people who learned information about traumas, attachment style, narcissists, ADHD, BPD, emotions, and thoughts, but never actually practice mental health tools. That is the equivalent for reading every book about weightlifting, but never actually lift weight. How good of a weightlifting coach would someone be who never did a pull up or squat in their life? How great of a tennis coach would someone be if they never held a tennis racket in their hand? And how great of a mental health coach would someone be who never changed their brain and let go of attachments, obsessions, and is practicing mental health tools every day? And here's the moment you waited for. We will start with entangling the warped reality you created. You created that reality by spending endless hours obsessing in your head. We are going to take back that territory inside and outside of your head from those obsessive thoughts, emotions and behaviors. We will follow up by removing your identity from that person. We will do that by building back your value in yourself through behaviors and actions. We will be changing your brain with the power of your focus in a direction that creates new pathways and finally help you to enjoy your life again. Here we go. Lesson number one. Your reality is completely warped as a result of your obsessive thinking and the toxic emotional cocktail created in your body, aka the emotional addiction to that person. I want to make clear that I'm not exaggerating this point. Your judgment and thinking is completely out of order. Like a computer that caught a virus whose whole system is clouded by that virus and you think you are still rational and working fine. But your morals, values, your balance and your sense of self is lost. To you, nothing is more important than either getting back with that person or fixing the feelings and thoughts with whatever behaviors will give you relief. Both of these paths will lead to destruction. Listen to me now. You will probably not believe the following statement, but again, that's okay. I can assure you that in a year, you will look back at the situation you're in and you will shake your head. The reason you will shake your head is because you woke up from that spell or hallucination and you don't understand how you ever were in love with that person. 
You can't see that right now because you're on a completely different radio station than you will be in a year from now. Your current radio station is continuously playing the same song of that person being the only one and without that person, nothing feels the same. The problem is that you trust your feelings and thoughts. That wouldn't be a problem if the brain's manual wouldn't come from a traumatic past. It's only a problem now though, because if you practice the following lessons, you will detach and on some morning wake up and have absolutely no feeling for that person anymore. I know what you're gonna say. I know, I know. This situation is different. And I've never been so in love with anyone and I just need a way to get them back and make them love me and then I can be happy. Why am I not good enough for them? How can I fix this? How can I become the person they love? I love them more than anyone else. And you don't understand. They are different than anyone else. They are my soulmate. We are meant to be. No one has a character like them. I will never find someone who I love so much or have the same connection with. They are my twin flame. They have the same astrology, moon rising, and the way we met could have only happened this certain way because they know my cousin or they tripped over my shoe at the gym or we ran into each other at a chipotle and grabbed the same napkin holder at the same time. Listen, I heard it all. And you know what happened every time? Every time, a year later, you will fall in love with another person who is even better and you look back and you can't believe you ever wanted to be with that person. And then if you lose yourself again and the relationship ends, you will come to me and say, I lost my soulmate. And I will be like, but wait, you said that about Sarah a year ago and you would be like F Sarah I thought I loved her but I have no feelings for her Monica is my soulmate I didn't know what love is back in the day but I know now I love Monica Monica is it and you will be completely sure that you lost your soulmate this time again there's people in this comment section who can tell you the exact same story that I just mentioned. Every time the brain will make you believe that this time it's different. It's because the obsession has created only one program that is running in your head right now. And that program is using confirmation bias to make the story as real as possible. You don't want to be with anyone else and don't even feel like getting to know someone else. How do I know? It happened to me seven times. And even at a time where I was tremendously aware and every time I came out of it and saw that I was under a crazy spell. And when I was out of that spell, I felt like nothing for that person anymore. And I was so glad I never stayed or got into a longer relationship with them. So the only thing I want you to consider for lesson one is that the brain has the ability to warp your reality, especially when you have a deep need for love and you have been abandoned as a child and how the programming gives you urges of chasing love. I also want you to know that the behavior you are doing based on those toxic emotional and thought obsessive cocktails can be very dangerous. You probably already did things that are out of character and to make feelings feel better. This can lead to dangerous situations like stalking someone, fighting over that person with the new boyfriend or girlfriend. Please, for your own sake, watch this video until the end and start applying the tools I give you. The future you will thank you because you have such a beautiful life still ahead of you. I promise you that. In the future, you will have wonderful moments of fulfillment and love, and you will say, I'm glad I didn't do anything stupid back in the day. Trust me, I'm thankful that even in the hardest times, I came back to my practice. So don't do something stupid. At least the ones who live to see their joyful life, because sadly there's people who ended it all because they got so lost in the mix. I promise you, I promise you, you will be happy again. I promise you that. Not only that, but happier than ever before. Lesson number two, breaking the spell. We need to unwarp the reality, of course. How do we start? By creating space. If you keep physical contact, it's harder to cut out the compulsions. I know your emotions and thoughts don't want you to cut the cord because they say there's still hope. And if you cut the cord, it's over. Well, ask yourself, 
do you always want to be a slave to another person's behavior? Or do you want to finally start living your life as your own main character? Like any movie, it's gonna have some difficulties to overcome, but that's better than living in someone else's movie. Plus, once you're detached, you'll be glad you'll be out of that part of the movie. I will give you the practical action steps first and then explain you why they are important. Number one, and some of you will not like this because you still have hope to fix the relationship, but this is essential to your mental health. B -b -b block them and get rid of everything, and I mean everything, as good as you can that reminds you of them. All memories. You can delete all of it or you can at least put them in a folder where you don't ever see them. And get rid of any memories at home. Don't play with me. Yes, that hoodie and that picture and that birthday card too. It's for your mental health. And stop listening to that song. Stop listening to Bruno Mars. I know you do it. The reason why we do that is to create the possibility for some little spaces where you don't get reminded and triggered every time you see that thing that reminds you of them. That little memory could cause you to go on an unconscious daydreaming story which teaches your brain that you love thinking and obsessing about them. Then your brain will bombard you with more thoughts and obsessions for the next days and weeks. Part 2. Stop mentioning their name ever again. <laughs> I'm serious. Stop talking to your friends and family about them. I know you do it to get relief from a feeling. That is called a compulsion to get relief from a feeling. It will hurt your mental health more. You want to teach your brain that this is a non-issue. That doesn't mean that the brain will not try hard to get you to talk to your friends and family to make the feelings feel better. But stop it! Cut it out now. Your friends and family are probably already used to you venting and talking to them about your ex. So they will ask. When they ask, don't tell me this. But they, they asked. I have to talk. I have to be polite. No. You will say, I don't want to talk about that person anymore. Please respect that it's for my mental health. You will have some friends who will immediately stop. Very respectful friends. And you will have some who don't like that you are not the perfect puzzle piece anymore that's venting with them about their failed relationships. They will try again. You have to be persistent. No, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Because venting is a compulsion and an addiction like drinking. So enabling you in it is like handing you alcohol if you're an alcoholic. You have to take up more healthy territory and you can only do that if you stop engaging in the territory of that person. Part 3. Taking up territory inside your head. Now that we got some more space on the outside, we need to now, very importantly, unwrap the reality on the inside of your head. Now you might say, but how can I stop thinking of them? The thoughts and the feelings are constantly attacking me and reminding me. I don't ask you to stop the thoughts and the emotions. You might be like, what? You can't stop the thoughts entering your head. And I'm not asking you to do that. But there's something that you can do to show the brain that you care about different things. You can stop talking back to the thoughts. Stop talking back to them. You talking back to those thoughts creates the obsession. Listen to that. You talking back to the thoughts creates that obsession. Remember, the thoughts are allowed to come in and be there, but you don't talk back to them. Don't talk, talk back. Instead, you bring your focus to something else. More on that later. Number two of creating space on the inside. Emotions. Stop trying to fix them. If you are not willing to be uncomfortable, you cannot break patterns because the old toxic patterns try to manipulate you into controlling and fixing the situation with uncomfortable feelings. If you follow the uncomfortable feelings of jealousy or abandonment or sadness or depression, you are feeding those patterns. Trying to fix or get relief of these emotions with your behavior is actually feeding the pattern as well. Stop trying to be happy. Stop trying to make feelings feel better. 
that will make you more unhappy in the long run. Stop checking on emotions. Stop checking on emotions. Stop checking on dreams. Stop judging your emotions as good or bad. Stop giving them meaning. Stop giving them meaning. Stop giving them meaning. We are going to completely stop debating anything with the brain, emotions and thoughts wise, and we only focus on one thing. Lesson number three. We are changing. Dun, 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 dun. Going from the emotional and thought addictive engine to the valued action engine. We are stop living based on trying to make feelings feel better or getting rid of thoughts. And we start living based on what actions support your life. When we act on the actions that support our lives, we can't do that while still talking back to the thoughts and spending time on them. We have to act on those valued actions mindfully. Being mindful doesn't mean you need to have a quiet mind or no emotions. It means all the emotions and thoughts are allowed to be there while you keep your focus on the valued actions. When we act on the actions that support our lives, we can't at the same time still talk back to the thoughts in our heads because then we show the brain that we still care about the old pattern. We have to act on those valued actions mindfully. Perfect word. Being mindful doesn't mean you need to have a quiet mind or no emotions. It means all the emotions and thoughts are allowed to be there while you keep your focus on the valued actions. This will be the biggest key in getting over that person because as long as you're engaging with the emotions and thoughts, you stay stuck. When you act mindfully on the valued actions, like going to the gym, going to a concert with your friends, building your business, creating TikTok painting videos, etc., you are showing your brain that you are outside of your head and inside of your head, spending time and energy on those valued actions. This is showing the brain that the old patterns you used to spend time on, like the obsessing on that ex or trying to fix emotions, is not applicable anymore. The brain is a very efficient organ. Over time, it will not give you what you don't use. You are making it inactive, which means you are losing attachment. This will not only create a richer, clearer reality for you, but in the long term, you are tremendously improving your relationship with your emotions. You might be like, what? Don't, I don't understand. You seem like to ignore emotions. Those therapists told me that's unhealthy. <laughs> no, we never talked about suppressing. We talked about accepting. Let me explain. By you trying to fix emotions, the brain who only understands the language of behavior thinks you love fixing emotions. Now as your best friend, it wants to support you in fixing more emotions and will give you more emotions. So the more you try to fix anxiety, the more anxiety the brain will give you. The more you try to get relief of jealousy, the more jealousy the brain will give you. Let me give you an example to understand better. Imagine you living in a house. Yeah, right. Who can afford a house in 2023, you say? Mm, remember our grandparents bought a house for 30000 and now it's $6 million? That's what I said, imagine, okay? Imagine if you're in a house and you have too many chairs in the house, like hundreds of chairs. And you say, I don't want these chairs, it's too many chairs. And you start throwing the chairs out the house. You start throwing th chair by chair. You throw them out the window. The brain looks at this and it's not like, oh, let me help them get rid of the chairs because they don't want so many chairs in the house. They want more space in the house. It doesn't think like that. It looks at your behavior because its language is behavior. And it sees you throwing chairs out the house. And it says, <laughs> they love throwing chairs out the house because that's what they do. They throw chairs out the house. And I'm their best friend, the brain. So I want to support them in the things that they love, which clearly is throwing chairs out the house. So to support them in doing the things that they love, which is throwing chairs out the house, I have to give them more chairs. 
So the brain goes to Ikea, builds some chairs, brings more in the house, and brings the ones in the house that you already threw out the house. Something click? Now substitute chairs with emotions and thoughts. The more you try to get rid of thoughts and emotions, the more the brain gives you more of those things because it thinks you love fixing those things. So it wants to give you more of those things. That's why intrusive thoughts come over and over again because you are trying to get rid of them and you are hating on them. You are doing something with them. You are engaging with them. So the brain's like, oh, they're playing with the thoughts. They love the thoughts. Give them more thought toys. Now. Brain's not mean, it's just doing its job. So what have we learned from the chair story? We have to show the brain that we care about with our behavior inside our heads and outside our heads. That's why outside of our head, we want to spend time on the valued actions. And inside of our heads, we want to also spend time on the valued actions and not on the thoughts about the X. Number four, valued actions. This is the metric of success. You might be like, but no, the metric of success is that we feel better. Nope. If you make the metric of success that you feel better, you are still seeing the unwanted feelings as something to fix. And you remember what fixing thoughts and emotions does, or do you want me to tell you the chair story again? I tell my clients all the time, they love it. And I act it out. So we need to change the game. We need to change your goals. This is revolutionary and immensely effective. We need to change from making the success to get rid of feelings and thoughts to do actions that you want to do that support you mindfully. That you do mindfully to support you. Yeah. This is the change and now listen carefully from being reactive to being proactive. This is an important differentiation because you've been reactive, reacting to hurtful and unwanted emotions and thoughts. We want to change your behavior from being reactive to being proactive, to show your brain that you are the boss. Boss up. You want to write your values down. Don't be lazy. There's a very strong reason for that. By writing your valued actions on a whiteboard, you are pushing those valued actions outside of your head for you to see this way your mind cannot trick you and if you say no my mind is not tricking me i know what i have to do you already lost your brain has an entire data bank since you're a little child on what thoughts and emotions you react to any excuse combined with any emotion it knows triggers you for you to avoid valued actions it has in its repertoire I tell all my clients in our first session to get a whiteboard with an easel, a big one, a big whiteboard, big whiteboard with an easel that they fall over. So it's in their way and they have to pay attention to it. Then when you wake up in the morning and the brain says, you have anxiety, you need to think about your ex. You see Jim on the whiteboard and you are more likely to go with those emotions and thoughts. And with that, over time, show your brain you don't care about them anymore. Listen carefully now. What actions support your life? The value garden exercise. We are doing now an exercise that is so important that I do it with all my clients on the first session. It is called the value garden exercise. This exercise was created by Mark Freeman and I put my own spin on it. And you're doing it now. Take a piece of paper. You go now. You stop the video. You get a piece of paper now. Don't trick me. Get a piece of paper and write down these seven values. Spread out like different fields of fruits and vegetables you are growing in your garden. These are not in order. Number one, physical fitness. Number two, relaxation. Number three, romantic relationships. Number four, family and friends relationships. Number five, fun. Number six, creative expression. And number seven, business slash money. Now comes the cool work, the exercise. Now you write five actions under each part of the gardens, right? The different value guard, values that you wrote. 
They're all different fields that you're growing with water and sunlight and fertilizer. These five actions are consistent of things you're already doing and things you want to do, but you haven't done yet because the brain says, we're not ready yet. We have to heal trauma first. We have to read more self-help books first. We have to get rid of our uncomfortable feelings first. We have to get rid of doubt first. We have to be confident first to do our projects, etc. As an example for physical fitness, it could be boxing, gym, pilates, yoga, running, eating healthy, etc. Creative expression, you might want to start a podcast or you love dancing and singing. For family and friends, it's anything you want to spend your time on with your family and friends, like charade night, game night, or travel, or going to play bowling, etc. If you have a romantic relationship or not, write down what your ideal relationship looks like. What activities are you guys doing? What do you want to spend your time on with them? Be as specific as possible. Maybe you want to go to the gym with them. Maybe you want to travel with them, etc. Don't just write outside activities. Write what you care about. This exercise will also help you to get to know yourself better. Because most people are so reactive in their life to chase validation of other people and fix emotions and thoughts that they don't even know anymore what they're interested in. Write those actions on the whiteboard, on notes, on your phone, set them as alarms, on postal notes, write them in the sand, on the beach, or tattoo them on your face, I don't care. Wait, don't tattoo them on your face. You ass! No, I'm joking. Also, write down on the whiteboard your intentions to change your metric of success from fixing emotions and thoughts to valued actions. Now that you've written those actions, ask yourself, what is the water of your garden? The answer, of course, is actions. You grow your garden with actions. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think your garden cares about your feelings or thoughts? I'm going to give you the answer away now because I cannot really talk to you. I'm in a YouTube video. I'm real, by the way. Talk to me. No. Your garden doesn't care about your emotions and thoughts. Look, I pretend I'm your garden right now, right? Hey, John or Sally, it's, it's so great that you have anxiety and all those thoughts and you're jealous and, and you, you, you're depressed in your bed, but look at the garden of physical fitness. It's dying. Go to the gym. You can have the sadness. You can have the jealousy and go anyway. Go. Look, it's dying. It needs water. You need to do actions. And, 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 and Sally, look at the garden of creative expression. I know you have the thoughts of like not feeling good enough and doubt, but can you just make TikTok videos now of your paintings? Do it. Do it. Because your behavior will show us that you're good enough. Show it. Your garden doesn't care about your emotions and thoughts. Some of you guys will be like, oh, but I've done these things with the emotions and thoughts, but why are they still there? Because you're still checking them. And because you're not doing things mindfully, because even if you do those actions, if you're still spending time in your head trying to fix emotions and thoughts, you're still feeding the patterns, all right? Number five, do more actions. I'm not even joking that when I see people who have the most problems getting over a breakup is that they don't do enough actions. This goes for people with depressions and social anxiety as well. Stop being at home all day. Go out the house right away. If you go somewhere to work, stop spending time in your head and stop scrolling every 15 minutes at work. If you don't like your job, this is a great opportunity to focus after work on a skill or passion that will bring you income in the future. Remember, the metric of success is action. And no, that doesn't mean to be a workaholic. People for some reason think I only talk about working and physical fitness. I also mentioned values like fun, creative expression, time with your family and friends, and relaxation as values. Do more action to support those. But really important, practice mindfulness. Because if you keep spending time in your head on those thoughts, you keep feeding the patterns. You will not feel like doing actions a lot of times. The brain will give you the feeling of not feeling like it, which is also a feeling to make you do the compulsions of not doing the things that will support you. Remember, it uses anything for you to stay away from the perceived danger. Do actions while not feeling like it. 
The paradox is that over time, you build so much emotional fitness and habituation of the brain, everything will be easier and you will feel so much better in the long run. Number six, stop telling me it's hard. This is a gift. You don't have to unwrap it. If you want to be better, you do it. If not, you might need more pain to change. Stop asking me how to make it easy on you. You need to break the pattern of not wanting to be uncomfortable. That's exactly how the brain manipulates you to stay in your old programming. Number seven, meditation is one of the most important practices you could ever do to let go of obsessions and attachments. It's a priority. People don't understand that. Don't you see that meditation is the practice ground for living an effective life? In meditation, you sit with any emotions and thoughts and train your focus to stay on your senses, aka the present moment. In life, emotions and thoughts come up that you usually react to, but to be successful, you need to be unbothered by these patterns and keep acting on the actions that support your garden of life. It's a direct reflection of meditation. It's a direct reflection of being with all emotions and thoughts while focusing on your breath. You literally practice the emotional fitness and mental focus that gives you the ability to be efficient and successful while not being a slave to the addictive patterns. Every time I mention meditation, I get resistance from people. Isn't it meditation when I play tennis or make music or do yoga? No, it's not. That's mindfulness. Then others say, I'm not good at meditation. I can't get my thoughts to quieten or I feel anxiety and not relaxed. Contradictory to some incompetent meditation teachers' opinion, the practice of meditation is not about quieting your mind or feeling relaxed. That might be one of the results while practicing, but having the goal of a quiet mind and relaxed state causes just more resistance and the opposite. You are hating on the thoughts and emotions that are there because if you want to have a quiet mind and there's still thoughts, you get upset about the thoughts, which causes more resistance. Your only job in meditation is to sit down, set a timer. For beginners, it's 15 to 20 minutes, not less. For more advanced, it's 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And from time to time, you can go to over an hour. Don't ever get up before the timer rings because if you do, you show your brain that, you, that, that it is the boss. The thoughts, feelings of impatience or anxiety made you stop the meditation early. Sit with your eyes closed and focus on your breath. Don't talk back to the brain, which means don't talk back to the thoughts. Don't get into an argument. Don't daydream or start trying to fix emotions. Be okay with any emotions and thoughts and focus on your breath. If you get tricked for some time by the brain, that's okay. Just focus back on your breath. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to take up more territory. Start to meditate every day. Show yourself that you can sit with any emotions and thoughts and bring your brain back to the present moment. Don't think that having thoughts is wrong. That messes a lot of people up. You can have millions of thoughts. Just don't talk back to them and focus back on your breath. And don't expect to be happy or relaxed. Be okay with being uncomfortable. Meditation is a life-changing tool, but I can't do it for you. I can only do it for me. And I do because I care for myself. Number seven, physical sports. Physical sports will support you with your mindfulness practice. Moving your body gives you a great beginner level to practice mindfulness because you can focus on your movements of your muscles, your breath, changing scenery, or the present moment actions of whatever sports you play. In addition, you show yourself that you care for yourself, which is adding to the mountain of self-value and is taking away from chasing validation from that person. Go to yoga, boxing, pilates, swimming, playing ball with friends, etc. Schedule as many of the ones you like during the week as possible. And when you schedule it, go at that time if you feel like it or not. Number eight, social events. Stop avoiding social events, even if you don't feel like it right now. Go to hikes with friends, play sports and start some business together. And for the love of God, stop mentioning that person. No talk about that person even if you feel the urge. Remember, my voice in your head before you open your mouth with your friends to make feelings feel better. Stop! Stop! Tell your brain stop and use the affirmation Abram Hicks said, 
I don't have to think about that right now. Come back to sharing your values and interests with your friends and mindfully listening to them and doing valued actions with them. You will feel like venting, but that's feeding the toxic patterns and the brain lures you in with those patterns. Instead, practice sharing your values and interests and jokes which shows your brain you value yourself and not chasing validation of another person. Don't use drugs to make feelings feel better. Getting drunk from time to time is not the end of the world, but don't make it a habit. And last but not least, number nine. You don't have to be perfect. Just take up more territory. Start in the beginning of the day right away. Because if you start your day with compulsions, you're going to continue your day with compulsions. Just add more territory by proactively spending your life the way you want it in actions. Don't make success dependent if you feel better or have no thoughts about the person, but that you do more actions in your value garden. Paradoxically, in the long run, you will be happier, but still don't make it the goal. If you mess up some days by doing compulsions, that's okay. You still got stronger from all the practice you did up to this point. Think of it like this. As an analogy, if you say you want to go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, and you went Monday and Wednesday, but Friday, you're like, I'm tired, and you had cake, and you went out with your friends partying and drinking, and on Saturday you said, oh, I messed everything up, I might as well stop. Did you get stronger? Yes, you did, because you went Monday and Wednesday. Yeah, maybe Friday, you went a step back, but that's okay. If you go Monday again, even if you don't go Monday again, if you go Wednesday again and Friday again and Sunday again, you're going to get stronger, okay? So don't try to be perfect, make it messy. Just ask yourself, how can you make tomorrow easier for yourself? By going to sleep on time, eating a healthy meal and laying out your workout clothes for the morning. You got this. And if you want to go deeper to understand these concepts like mindfulness, emotional fitness, check out my other YouTube videos. But always balance out watching with doing though. So when you watch the next videos, make sure you also lay out an action plan and take action after. Love you guys. Peace. bad at saying bye bye what's up guys this is star i hope you enjoyed the video because i really put a lot of work in my youtube videos it's my favorite platform i really wanted to give the most value not only that if you didn't know i have an entire teachable platform where i have video courses available on emotional fitness how to create self-worth how to change from the emotional addictive engine to the valued action engine you can see those video courses in the description.